We're live. All right. We are talking about the musculoskeletal system. Welcome back to the people at home. Hello again to the people here. It's still the same day, um, unfortunately. <laughs> um, all right. So MSK is tough for one specific reason. It's because we talk about a lot of involved parts, how things activate and get translated and blah, 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 and a different type of cell and blah, everything. It's very complicated, but we're going to try to get, dumb it down and get through it in an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> so let's see if we can do it a little faster than that, hopefully. I want to go home as badly as you guys do, and you guys have that orgo exam and everything. For the people back home, check out the description for always the link to the spreadsheet, which documents all of our recorded lectures and any mistakes I make therein. I might make a couple in this one, so I'll have to write it up, but I'll try not to. Um, and, of course, the associated folder for our lecture series, which has the sign-up document, my study guide, and all my notes. You guys ready to go? Okay. So in order to talk about the, muscul the musculoskeletal system, we have to talk about the muscular system and the skeletal system, right? So let's talk about the muscular system first, and let's talk about types of muscle. Number one is skeletal muscle. which is most likely the most abundant inside of your body, right? When we, talk about, when we talk about muscles like biceps and quadriceps and hamstrings and calves and abdominals and, ball and pecs and stuff like that, that's all skeletal muscle, right? When you eat meat, if you eat like a ribeye steak or you eat, you know, a flank steak or a chicken leg or something, you're eating skeletal muscle, right, mostly. It's responsible for voluntary movement and innervated by the somatic nervous system. So. Uh, innervated by somatic nervous system. The reason I write that out is because SNS means sympathetic nervous system, not somatic. Right? And it's for voluntary movement. So, if I want to take this and bring it up towards my shoulder, right? That is a voluntary motion, mostly carried out by the biceps muscle. And the biceps are a skeletal muscle, right? The pattern of actin and myosin inside of this muscle makes repeating units known as sarcomeres, right? So the functional unit here is a sarcomere which is a pattern of actin and myosin bridged together, right? And it creates a striated look, which is why this type of muscle is also called striated muscle. And this type of muscle is also multinucleated. That's a question you get a lot, that you see a cell and it has multiple nuclei inside of it and you, it has striations, that's a skeletal muscle cell, right? And then in the notes it says red fibers and white fibers. You don't really get asked that all too often, but the red fibers are red because of myoglobin. Red fibers have higher myoglobin and they're slow twitch fibers with many mitochondria, right? So I am a cross country runner. I like to go for seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 mile runs, right? I use a lot of my red fibers. Many, many mitochondria increases the efficiency of my cells to make energy, and they produce energy over a long time. A sprinter would have more white fibers, fast twitch fibers, less myoglobin, less efficiency, but more rapid output, right? Next, we have smooth muscle, right? So we have skeletal muscle, and then we have smooth muscle. So, if that was for voluntary motion, this is for involuntary motion. So, innervated, autonomic nervous system, involuntary motion. That makes sense? Yeah? 
No striations over here. Why? Because the fibers are disorganized. They're all this mishmash, stuff like that, right? And these specifically, you don't really need to know it, but they maintain a low level of constant contraction, right? And then depending on what your body's doing, they contract more or less, right? So these are more of the muscles that control like peristalsis and period cramps and uh, going to the bathroom, like the need to go to the bathroom, things like that, right? Also the erector pili muscles, smooth muscles, they, they make your uh, hair stand up, stuff like that, right? And the last type of muscle they want you to know about is cardiac muscle. They're very, very special. Of course, where do you find cardiac muscle? No, nah, you're all wrong. I'm kidding, it is in the heart. Yeah. It's cardiac muscle. Yeah. Cardiac meaning heart. There used to be, when I was in cross country in high school, I would run at this park, it's called Sunken Meadow State Park. If any of you guys are from Long Island, you would know Sunken Meadow, right? And there's two hills in the 5K at Sunken Meadow. The first one's called Snake Hill because it goes like this, you call it Snake Hill. The second one's called Cardiac Hill because it's like a 400 meter incline that's like this steep and it's, it's ridiculous. It is so hard to get up. And it's called Cardiac Hill because we always made the joke that it would give you a heart attack by the time you're done with it. So shout out to Cardiac Hill. So it has cardiac muscle. It has characteristics of both. Both what? Skeletal and smooth. So first of all, it's uninucleated. There's one nucleus, right? Mostly. It's autonomic, but it has striations. And very specifically, they contain something intercalated or intercalated discs and gap junctions. So the intercalated disc contain gap junctions, right? And those gap junctions allow the cardiac cells to communicate with one another, to communicate ions to one another. And why is that important? Because remember that when we talked about the heart, I'm gonna blow your fuck I'm gonna blow your fucking mind right now. Remember that when we talked about the heart, we talked about the right atrium and the right ventricle, and the left atrium and the left ventricle, and we said, hmm, well, how does the heart start beating in the first place? Remember that we have an SA node and then an AV node. And then we have a bundle of Hiss, and then we have the Purkinje fibers. And the electrical conduction heading from the SA to the AV node, and then the AV delay, and then the AV node to the bundle of Hiss down the Purkinje fibers, the gap junctions help to release the ions that continue the contraction. That's why they need gap junctions, to communicate the cardiomyocyte action potential between one another. What was the word I used there? The cardiomyocyte heart muscle cell. So this is the big thing right here. They want you to know that heavy. They want you to know that really, really well. And these have a very specific capacity to maintain rhythm. And that makes sense. Because hopefully your heart's beating right now, I, I hope, and hopefully it's beating in rhythm. Because if it's not, I would go to a hospital. <laughs> this is where, not even Kaplan or the MCAT, just this is where the human body in general just starts taking a piss. It, it literally just starts shitting all over you. Because now, we have to talk about my least favorite topic in the entire book, muscular microanatomy.
And did you guys realize that I moved my laptop closer to me? Because I'm not going to remember what's on this screen. Okay. So I'm going to do my best to draw this. But if you guys look in the notes where it says microscopic structure of skeletal muscle, you'll see this diagram. So we've got these thick, thick lines. And then they continue over here. And they continue over here. It's fantastic. It's falling. All right. And then we have a band and a band and a band and a band. And then we have a band. And we have a, oh my god, there's nothing over there. A band. And then we have the same thing over here. And it looks something like, something like that, right? If you look at the diagram. These right here, we're just going to label this. And I honestly, like, you don't need to know all this, but I'm just doing it for the sake. This is called a thick filament. And this stuff over here in between is called a thin filament. If, you, if you're writing strictly notes, don't copy this down. I would just find a diagram. Um, okay, so where were we? If you don't have this, if you're like taking notes and you're like writing this down, you don't need to do this. You can literally just look up like muscular microanatomy and look up like thick filament, thin filament, M line, Z band, blah, 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 all that stuff. But basically what you want to know is that this right here, the H zone, what's going to happen is that when the thin filament, which is the actin and the troponin and the tropomyosin, when that contracts, it's going to shorten the whole thing, right? It's going to collapse all this together. So this is the relaxed. And then when it contracts, it's going to come together like that, right? That's all you would need to know from this. So the thin filament contracts, and it brings the thick filaments together, right? OK. So the thick filaments are myosin, and then the thin filaments are actin, troponin, and tropomyosin, right? And the way you're going to remember that is that the big thing is actin, but it's actually just actin. Right? Actin makes up the thin because it's actin, actin filaments. Okay? I'm not fantastic at teaching the whole sarcomere thing, but I am pretty good at teaching what's coming next. How it contracts. Right? So the gross structure of a myocyte, if you guys look, once again, you'll be able to find this. So a muscle is split up into muscle fibers, and then those muscle fibers break down into these things. Right? So those muscle fibers are the myocytes. And then basically what happens is that those myocytes, they have a cell membrane. And that cell membrane is called what? It's called a sarcolemma. Right? So the sarcolemma is the cell membrane of skeletal muscle. cells. And this can carry its own action potential. So what happens to initiate muscle contraction is number one, a neuron fires acetylcholine into the neuro neuromuscular junction, which is the junction between the nerve terminal of a neuron and the sarcolemma. So what happens is ACH gets fired at this neuromuscular junction, and it binds to the sarcolemma, right? So two, ACH binds receptor and leads to sarcolemma depolarization, OK?
Huh? On my phone. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it. Guess we gotta speed up. My phone's dying. Fuck. All right. You guys are like, fuck it, thank God. <laughs> Number three. The sarcolemma, the depolarization, is carried onto something known as the T-tubules, the transverse tubules. So the AP is carried to T-tubules, or the transverse tubules, right? And if you look at the diagram of the muscle fiber, right, the myocyte, you'll be able to see the transverse tubules running up and down. And what they do, right, is the T-tubules transfer the action potential to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What is the sarcoplasmic reticulum? It is the storage site of calcium for muscle contraction. The sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium. And when the t action potential carried by the T-tubules hits the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's going to release its calcium. Right? Cool. Right? Someone remember that we're on number three. Oh, wait, no, we have to do number four first. So number four, action potential is transferred to sarcoplasmic reticulum, SR, which leads to the release of calcium into myocyte. Guys following? Yeah? Someone remember that we're up to number five. Because I need to draw a diagram. Okay. You guys can find this diagram in the notes, right? So basically, the balls with the dots on them, you see how the dots are kind of covered? Those balls are actin. All right? The thing that's covering the dots on the actin, that is tropomyosin. The line that's cock blocking the dots, that's tropomyosin. You can find this diagram in the book. You can look up actin, tropomyosin, troponin online. You can find it anywhere, right? And if that's tropomyosin, the last thing is troponin, right? And troponin has that circle on it, right? That circle is a calcium binding site. I now realize how small this is. I apologize. All right. So the calcium binding site on troponin Troponin is attached to tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is attached to actin. And actin has those dots. What are those dots? What number are we up to? Five, right? Five. Calcium binds the calcium binding site of troponin. Calcium binds the calcium binding site of troponin. This causes what we call a conformational change. Anyone from orgo, that, those words horrify you. 
a conformational change, where the tropomyosin spins out of the way, right? So conformational change of tropomyosin makes it move from actin. So what's going to happen is this leads to, so if the calcium binds here, it leads to this. Now draw a little bigger. See those dots are exposed now? The tropomyosin moves over here because the troponin has calcium in it. So the calcium binding the troponin causes the tropomyosin to move out of the way. You know what those dots are? They're myosin binding domains. Myosin binding domains. Guys, this is tough. I don't expect you to remember all this in one pass. You're going to have to go back and read through this in the book and stuff like that. So, depolarization, action potential travels down the sarcolemma. Travels down the T-tubules to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium into the myocyte. Calcium binds troponin. Tropomyosin moves off of the myosin binding point on actin. And now, myosin is allowed to bind. If that's actin, what is this? The thin filament or the thick filament? This is the thin filament. So now, we can have a thick, thin filament interaction. Because what's the thick filament made of? Myosin, right? So now, the myosin can interact with the actin. And what's going to happen is that the myosin will be able to pull on the actin. So the thick filament will pull on the thin filament and make it shorter. Does that make sense? Yes? It, it doesn't have to. If it doesn't make sense, we'll go through it again at the end, right? So now we are ready to shorten the sarcomere, right? What number is this? Six? So number seven, myosin Binding groove of actin, which is the thin filament, is revealed. Okay. Now we have to talk about cocked and uncocked myosin, right? So remember, we're on number eight. So myosin has two conformations. And cocking myosin causes shortening of the sarcomere, right? So I'm going to leave that there, because this is the state we're in right now. And let's talk about myosin. Myosin looks a little something like this. OK? And has a groove. So it looks like this. And has a groove. And on that groove, it holds ADP. I'm going to draw it larger. Hold on. This is ADP. And this is an inorganic phosphate. So what do you think that used to be? It used to be ATP. And then it got hydrolyzed, right? This is known as uncocked myosin. It's also known as charged. That's what I call it. I call it charged myosin. Because that myosin is ready to do the head stroke. OK? So this form of myosin, A, globular myosin heads bind to actin on myosin binding domains. This guy right here goes, goes right there. OK? Globular myosin heads bind to actin on myosin binding domains.
9. Myosin does something known as a power stroke. Myosin, power stroke, shortens the sarcomere. And this is known as contraction. Right? And this leads to ADP and PI dissociate from myosin. So what happens is that myosin is now attached to this, right? And here's the ADP and the PI. And what's going to happen is it's going to fall forward, right? So now it's going to look like this. Do you see how it's shortened? The angle, the angle got short, right? And now that's going to pull the rest of the chain with it. Do you see how that's going to shorten the sarcomere? Do you, do you see that? It's a lot better in the diagram. I know. I'm not the best at drawing. But the power stroke shortens the sarcomere, and now the ADP and the PI are gone. Right? So that's the contraction. OK? What's number 10? So that's cocked myosin, right? But now we have to uncock it again. So new ATP binds myosin and hydrolyzes, which leads to release from actin and reset tropomyosin. So tropomyosin moves back into place over the myosin binding domain and the myosin leaves. How does it leave? Well, the myosin now looks like this, right? So it's cocked. An ATP comes and attaches. So now it looks like this with an ATP right here. And when it hydrolyzes, it breaks the myosin back like this. So this is ADP. And this is PI, and it breaks the myosin like that. But what does it break it off of? It breaks it off of actin. So now the myosin is no longer attached to actin. And when the myosin moves away, the tropomyosin is allowed to come back in and cover up that myosin binding domain. Does that make sense? You guys will need to read this over and over and over. It took me maybe eight or nine times of looking at this diagram to fully understand what's going on but I hope a little bit of it makes sense. And I'm going to tell you one more thing before we close this part of the lecture off that is going to clear it up for you a little bit, right? Okay. Do you see how we need a new ATP for the muscle to relax? Because what's the new ATP doing? It's coming, it's attaching to cocked myosin, it's uncocking it and releasing it from the actin, right? What's rigor mortis? Rigor mortis is the complete muscle contraction without relaxation, right, after you die. Why? There's no more new ATP being formed. So if there's no more new ATP, you can't bind the myosin and hydrolyze it to remove it from the actin. So the myosin is permanently stuck on the actin and all the muscles are contracted because there's no new ATP to remove it. That's why you, you can remember, you need the ATP to remove the myosin from the actin. And once myosin is removed from the actin, the tropomyosin moves back into place, and the troponin waits for the next round of calcium. And let's go over it one more time, right? Action potential reaches the muscle, the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine binds to the receptor, causes a action potential in the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma carries the action potential down to the T-tubules. The T-tubules carry the action potential down to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium. Calcium binds troponin. Troponin and calcium move tropomyosin out of the way of the actin, which has the myosin binding domain. Cocked, uncocked myosin attaches to the myosin binding domain on actin. So the thick filament interacts with the thin filament, right? Myosin power strokes, cocks itself. That shortens the sarcomere. That is contraction, right? 
ATP comes along, attaches to the myosin binding groove, hydrolyzes, which causes the uncocking of myosin and the removal from actin. Once myosin is removed from actin, tropomyosin moves back into place. Troponin has already released his calcium, and we can restart the cycle because this is what we started with, right? So we can restart the whole thing. How do muscles relax? We've talked about this before. It was all started by acetylcholine binding the receptor, right? We have an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, which breaks down acetylcholine and stops the contraction so that no more action potentials are sent to the muscle. We are going to skip over simple twitch, summation, and tetanus because I don't think they're asked about all that often. And we're going to move straight on to bones and joints. And then we're done. What time is it? 8. What? I said 8.30, I was like, oh my god. <sighs> All right. Bones. The skeletal structure, right? So we have the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton, which you're not really asked about all that often, but the axial skeleton is the skull, the vertebral column, the rib cage, and the hyoid. Have we talked about the hyoid before? It's like the floating bone in your neck. It's this one right here. You can feel it, right? And it has two little horns. You can find, kind of feel the horns as well. The hyoid, it just kind of sits in your neck, and it looks like that from the front. If you look at it from the side, it'd have a greater horn and a lesser horn, and it'd come out in the front like this. Right here, that's the hyoid. Right? And it's the only bone in your body that's kind of floating. It doesn't really connect to any other bones. It just connects to muscles, right? And cartilage. The appendicular skeleton is the limbs and the pectoral girdle, which is like the scapula and the clavicle, and then the pelvis, right? Anything that's not the axial skeleton, basically. OK. So we have a couple of different types of bone, right? Macroscopic bone structure. So we have compact bone and spongy bone. So compact bone is dense and strong, but spongy bone has a lattice structure and it has cavities, right? So this is dense and this has cavities. Those cavities are filled with bone marrow. And what does bone marrow do? Yeah, erythropoiesis or hematopoiesis. I can never spell this, hematopoiesis, right? That's red bone marrow. And then we also have yellow bone marrow, which is mostly fat. Anyone here ever eaten bone marrow before? It's fucking delicious. It's so good. Grill that shit, spread it on toast, give it to me any day of the week. So good. I know the Uzbeks are very famous for their kebabs. And I had these kebabs one time where they took like ground beef and they take uh, bone marrow, raw bone marrow, and they scrape it and they mix it in with the ground beef so that when they grill it, it like melts it. Oh my fucking God. <laughs> this is why I have high cholesterol. All right. So appendicular bones are long bones, and they're pretty much like the stuff that you would think when you see bones. It's right here. Bones, right? And they talk about a bunch of different like, divisions of those bones, like the epiphysis, the metaphysis, the diaphysis, medical school stuff. Don't worry about it, right? OK. Now, I want you guys to remember one thing. The MCAT loves BBLs, right? Because the connection from a bone to a bone is done by a ligament. Bone, bone, ligament, right? Which means the connection from a muscle to a bone is? We have ligaments and we have tendons. I haven't figured out something for this yet, but that is a BBL, right? So bone, bone, ligament, and then you just remember the other one is tendon, right? Why don't we connect muscles to muscles? Because what the fuck would be the point, right? We need, we need an anchoring point, right? We need something to anchor onto. And the bones act as anchoring points for muscles. 
right? And the bones need to be connected so that you don't flop around all over the place. Anyone ever had tendonitis before? Oh, it sucks. It sucks. My co-captain, when I was running track uh, my senior year of high school, had really, really bad tendonitis. I put him out of running for six weeks. It was bad. Well, not out of running, but not running to his potential. OK. They give you this very complicated design of the bone structure. This is actually what bones look like. All they're trying to say here is that blood runs through bones. Bones have their own blood system. They have, they have a way of getting blood and blood cells and blah, blah, blah. They can communicate with the blood, the circulatory system is what they're saying, right? OK. Bones are mainly made of a compound known as hydroxyapatite. And it is calcium, phosphate, and hydroxide. Hydroxyapatite, right? Another thing to talk about in this chapter is bone remodeling. Throwback. Anyone remember what these two things do? Calcitonin, what does it do? Tones down serum calcium. How do we do that? By building bone, correct? So calcitonin tones down serum calcium by building bone. Who knows the name of the cell that's responsible for building bone? Osteoblasts build bone. So this activates osteoblasts. Very good. Dude's on a roll. So close. Parathyroid hormone increases serum calcium. What do I mean by serum? It's the amount in the blood, right? Serum calcium levels, the amount of calcium in the blood, right? How does it do that? It activates, what's the other type of cell called? Osteoclasts, right? And remember my little trick, osteoblasts build bone, osteoclasts chew bones. I'm an osteoclast, I chew on bones. They're delicious. They're good, right? <laughs> I'm an osteoclast, I chew bones. Then talk about cartilage. The one thing that you want to know about cartilage, for the MCAT at least, is that it's not like filled with blood like bones are. They're not really perfused. They're a very, very low vascular sort of tissue, right? And they're part of connective tissue. Um, then they talk a little bit about joints. Um, there are immovable joints, which are put together by sutures. So you can't move the joints in your skull. Your skull's not one bone. It's a bunch of fused bones all together, right? You can't move them. Huh? They're not movable. They're just not connected yet. They're just not completely connected yet. Because the babies have that little soft spot in the back of their head. And if you push it in, you're a terrible person. <laughs> I remember I was like watching I was watching this video and the dude's just like if XYZ had I'm just gonna go around the hospital and push in the little <laughs> soft parts of babies' heads, low battery. Yeah, well we've got like five minutes left in the lecture. He's like, yeah, I'm just gonna go around the NICU and push in the little soft spot on the back of babies' heads. <laughs> All right. Um, so joints are strengthened by ligaments. Uh, they talk about the synovial fluid, which is just the fluid inside of a joint, right? It's like for uh, lubrication. Um, they talk about like origin insertion. I really don't think that like comes up on the MCAT often enough uh, for, for me to talk about it. And the rest of the stuff is just a little bit of talk about how muscles work. So we have muscles that are flexors, we have muscles that are extensors, we have abductors and adductors, and then we have internal rotators and external rotators. So I guess we could talk about that if it ever comes up in a passage. So flexion is to decrease the angle of a joint. So this is the angle of my elbow joint, right? You're looking at it. This is the angle, it's 180 degrees. If I decrease the angle of the joint, that is called flexion. 
So this is called forearm flexion, right? And if that's the angle of the elbow joint and I increase it, that's called forearm extension, right? And then over here, this is the angle of my shoulder, right here. You're looking at 180 degrees. This is arm flexion and arm extension. Why didn't I say arm when it was this? Well, technically, this is the arm and this is the forearm, right? So this upper part is the arm. This whole thing is called the upper extremity, right? So arm flexion and arm extension. Why not upper extremity flexion? Because you can do this. And that's arm flexion with forearm flexion. And this is arm flexion with forearm extension, right? Does that make sense? Cool. Abductors move stuff away from the body. So this is abduction. And adduction, adductors, ADD, is to add stuff to the body, to bring it in towards the body. So adduction, ADD, is to add to the body. Abduction, ABD, is to move away from the body, right? Uh, internal and external rotators rotate things towards the midline and away from the midline. So this is internal rotation, and that's external rotation. Same way this is internal rotation, external rotation. Make sense? And uh, I don't know why they talked about that at the end of the chapter, but they did. And um, honestly, other than the whole actin, myosin, troponin, tropomyosin, blah, 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 um, that's the end of the chapter. And that's all I wanted to get through today. <laughs> it's all right, man. <laughs> um, so that's it. Next time, we'll talk about genetics and evolution, which is a very, very, very low portion of biology on the MCAT. And after that, we'll talk about Anki, how to use it, what it is, how I used it, and we'll begin chemistry, our second book on our path to finishing up this whole curriculum. Don't clap. So next time, on Tuesday, we will do chapter 12. We'll talk about Anki for a bit. Make sure on Tuesday you bring a device either a phone or an iPad or a laptop that you're going to use most often so that you can download Anki on that device, okay? Make sure you bring it with you, okay? All right, and uh, that's it. For the people back home, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.